Prospector News is media for educational purposes only and should not be construed as advice. We are not a certified financial analyst, licensed broker, or fund dealer, exempt market dealer, or hold a license to provide financial advice. We provide no legal opinion regarding accounting, tax, or law issues. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or the solicitation to buy or sell stocks or commodities. All opinions expressed are those of the participants and should not be relied upon when making investment decisions. Those decisions should be made with the advice of a personal financial advisor. If you have enjoyed our podcast, please hit the like and share buttons and be sure to hit subscribe. I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast. Uh, Joining me, I have Ryan Sistad, who is the Executive Director of Better in Our Backyard. Uh, Better in Our Backyard is a pro-mining lobby group out of northern Minnesota. And uh, welcome welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Michael. I appreciate it. Not a problem. For our listeners that aren't familiar with your organization, um, can you give a more in-depth description than what I just provided? Yeah, so thank you. So yeah, Better in Our Backyard uh, is an advocacy group um, that promotes responsible industrial development, uh, mainly in northern Minnesota. Um, And when we were created about five years ago, we kind of had a target audience of young professionals. And, um, you know, I kind of took over the reins a little bit a couple of years ago, three years ago, three and a half years ago, I should say. Um, And since then, we've kind of evolved to not only promote responsible industry with a target audience to young professionals, but um, basically to anyone that supports responsible industry uh, in northern Minnesota. So we do a lot of stuff for, um, you know, a lot of pro-mining type activities uh, for some proposed projects here in northern Minnesota. And then also, too, just in the past six months, um, we've uh, ventured into northern Wisconsin and northern Michigan. So uh, long term, uh, we're going to have a uh, base here in northern Minnesota and Duluth, Minnesota, but uh, we're going to be, you know, promoting responsible industry for all the upper middle Midwest here in the United States. Uh, so that's, that's what we do. We advocate for responsible industrial development. So there's a couple key main, key main mining projects that we advocate for uh, in Northern Minnesota, uh, which is uh, Twin Metals, Minnesota out of Ely, which is uh, just South of the Canadian border. Uh, Polymets North Med project, which is about, uh, I would say uh, 40 miles South of the Twin Metals project. Um, and then also, too, uh, we did a lot of advocacy work for Enbridge's Line 3 replacement project, which starts in Canada um, and ends in Superior, Wisconsin. And now that that's completed, we've been doing a lot of work for um, Enbridge regarding helping out with promoting uh, Line 5, uh, which has been under scrutiny the past couple of years, which um, that has allowed us to expand uh, into northern Michigan and into northern Wisconsin. Wonderful. Now, I'm... As a Canadian, I'm I'm somewhat confused because I've always considered Northern Minnesota as being like a pro resource area of of the United States. So, what kind of challenges are are is the mining industry experiencing in that area? Well, you know, I would actually say, Michael, you're you're pretty correct on that because you know Northern Minnesota and specifically northeastern Minnesota, um, you know, they've been mining iron ore. Uh, for over 130 years. So just a little bit of a background in terms of resources here in Northeastern Minnesota. Um, In terms of U.S. reserves, uh, Minnesota has 90% of the iron ore reserves in all the U.S. We have 95% of the nickel reserves, 34% of the copper reserves, um, and I believe around 88% of the U.S. cobalt reserves. Um, And we've been mining iron ore for over 130 years, and we've been doing so responsibly and safely. So historically, we have been very pro-industry, but um, you know, and this has kind of been known for, for a while now, uh, for longer than when Polymet started, but um, in terms of starting the permitting process, but, you know, throughout, throughout the years when Minnesota's mining iron ore, the, you know, it started becoming pretty apparent that we have a lot of copper and nickel resources. And in terms of groups being anti-industry, uh, we noticed from the Twin Cities area, which is uh, Southern Minnesota, and also a little bit from the Duluth area where I live, um, once Polymet started entering its permitting process, a lot of anti-industry groups um, started uh, taking place here in Northern Minnesota. So 
Uh, Polymet as a background is a proposed copper nickel mining project. Um, they're reusing an existing old iron mine site. And uh, so it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's a basically technically a brownfield redevelopment site. And they've been going through the permitting process for over 17 years. They want to mine copper and nickel. It's going to be an open pit mine. Um, they are technically, as of a couple of years ago, were Minnesota's first ever fully permitted copper nickel mine project uh, in northern in in Minnesota. And uh, but since then, you know, constantly uh, they become, you know, they, they uh, constantly um, are facing litigation issues, lawsuit issues, um, to a point where many of these anti-industry groups are becoming glorified law firms, or literally they are getting funded to fight any permit that gets approved for any type of industry project. So even like Enbridge's line three replacement project, um, you know, that had, was Minnesota's longest reviewed uh, pipeline project in Minnesota's history. I mean, they went through, I believe, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't reviewed my talking points a long time with line three, but I believe they went over six years into going through the permitting process just to replace an old existing pipe. I mean, it was a safety driven project. Um, and so in terms of local communities in northern Minnesota, you know, outside of Duluth and the Twin Cities, they're very pro industry because they understand like just how like I'm assuming many folks in Canada understand that these industry jobs are what drive communities, what build communities and, and what help local education and, and they pay good wages. And I would argue that in northern Minnesota, those who are against mining or any other industry projects are in the minority. Okay. Yeah, we've experienced similar in Canada. The uh, uh, the more rural, um, remote communities that are in mining belts, they understand it. But the decisions get made in the big cities, and uh, that's where the uh, that's where the uh, lobbyists and the environmental groups uh, tend to hang out. So it's yeah. almost like a an urban rural, uh, you know, conflict in a lot of ways. Yeah, and it, it's uh, it's it's too bad too, because you you would hope that you know, those groups and, and rural communities would actually work together uh, to get to a good solution, good balanced solution of creating good paying jobs and also protecting, you know, our pristine environment, which, you know, from better in our backyard standpoint, we wholeheartedly believe that with twin and polymet, um, you know, and, and Enbridge is proving that every day with their newly replaced pipe with line three, um, you can protect the environment while still creating good paying industry jobs, especially as technology continues uh, to get better. And especially as industry continues to innovate in their in their daily practices in comparison to say, you know, third world countries. So as an advocacy group, then is your role as a lobbyist or as an advocacy, meaning that you you go out and work in the community to help the uh, um, the industry tell their story to the to the local people? It's it's a lot of more advocacy role of telling industry you know the story of industry uh, to local folks and then also but you know where where my role has become unique is that um, you know and I would say that in a weird way that this is lobbying is that I've developed a good relationship with a lot of the local uh, county commissioners local mayors uh, you know state representatives state senators um, you know uh, our local congressmen. Um, so it's kind of a, I would say a mixture, but I would say 80% of what I do is advocacy. And, and that goes over well with the local communities. Yeah, I would say so. Um, overall, we haven't got as much pushback as we thought we would when I started developing a better relationship. Um, but you know, where I think better in our backyard is, is pretty unique is that, you know, one day we might feature a labor leader with a pro polymet quote, for example, um, and then the following day, we might feature a local congressman. And then the day after that, we might feature an intern uh, with a local company that would really benefit from polymet or twin metals or, uh, you know, if line five continues and stays running. Um, and then, you know, the next day we might feature a CEO. And then one day we might, you know, push out a factoid about these projects or, you know, why is copper essential uh, to our everyday lives? Why do we need nickel? Uh, for our electric vehicle batteries. So, you know, I try to every week, you know, my goal is to strike that that balance of, of telling that story, um, featuring politicians, featuring uh, business folks, featuring labor leaders, and then also educating our audience on why these projects are important and why these resources are important and, and why how we extract them or where we get them from in the world uh, is important as well. 
So the goal of the organization is to reduce opposition to these projects. Essentially, yes. And, and to educate on why it is better literally in our backyard. You know, I mean, obviously we're selfish in our area where we want to make sure that, you know, the nickel that we use for our batteries is coming from here in the U.S. But as, you know, as I've gotten, you know, more comfortable in my role and understanding, you know, just the worldwide view of it, you know, I, I would really, you know, like to see that if, you know, when we're not getting sourcing our own nickel or our copper, then we're making a point of, of, uh, of um, bringing in resources or buying resources, you know, from our friends like Canada, um, where we know that they're doing it just as right as we are. And, uh, and that's what I hope to see long term uh, for the nation, you know, as, as you know, just, you know, I'm assuming Canada is doing the same thing with leadership, but, you know, with our president, you know, they're, they're the, that administration, they're constantly pushing for renewable energy technologies. And in the back of my mind, it's like, you know, we should be making a point of, making sure that we're getting these resources here in the U S and then, and also Canada as well. And, um, and, and yeah, and I would argue that, you know, when we're talking about, you know, why it's better in our backyard yeah, to, it's a great question. It's, it's to reduce opposition, uh, to these projects because, you know, from supporters of these projects, it couldn't be more obvious on why you would support a project like polymet or twin metals or, um, you know, a new pipeline project. Yeah, I don't disagree. I, uh, I personally, I find it really interesting when I uh, see someone who has an electric car and I ask them where the power comes from and they point to the outlet and I'm going, okay, but where does the power come to go there? And they then point to the power line and, and I kind of go, well, I could keep going, but I'm pretty sure they're <laughs> not going to get to the power station yet. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And most of those metals aren't coming from our backyard currently, yet we have an abundance of them. So uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, yeah. Now, Ryan, um, on a personal note, um, I know you're a younger guy uh, in this business. You're 28. Um, how do your contemporaries view what it is that you're doing? Like when I see a lot of opposition, it seems to be uh, uh, coming from uh, young folk like yourself. Uh, so to see someone as young as you, you know, speak very passionately and knowledgeably in favor of mining uh, kind of strikes me as, as somewhat odd because it's not kind of what I see in the real world. Uh, well, to be quite, you know, to be completely transparent, it, it's pretty mixed, you know, like, for example, I'm going to be golfing with a buddy of mine here at around 530 today. And uh, he's against these projects, um, but we get along and, and we have a strong understanding of why I support it. He knows, you know, in my heart, you know, like my dad is, uh, for example, is a lifelong teamster. Uh, my grandpa is a lifelong, was a lifelong uh, iron worker, uh, union labor iron worker, and now obviously retired. And, and so part of what strikes home to me on these projects is that they all have PLA agreements, meaning that they're going to be, you know, these projects, these mining projects are going to be built by union labor. Enbridge employs a lot of union folks uh, in northern Minnesota. So this hits home to me outside of the logical arguments for these projects, which I agree with as well. And so he knows that and, uh, you know, we get along. And then I also have friends that, um, you know, that are into this industry where obviously we could talk all day about these projects and agree on everything. And um, but overall, you know, it's um, with my friends and colleagues, I have people that uh, support these projects and are also against it. But, you know, as long as you can have a friendly conversation, that's all you can ask for. And, you know, I think life would be pretty boring if you're constantly around people that just agree with everything that you agree with. And, uh, um, but then obviously too, here in Duluth, you know, there, you know, I have, uh, um, some folks that just don't want to be my friend because they know what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that's okay too. Yeah. Unfortunately it is now your, your buddy you're about to go golfing with. Yeah. How, how do you um, how do you think you would ever reach him to, to get him to change his mind? Just curious. Well, he used to own a Tesla. So I try to tell him, you know, hey, you know, where do you where do you think that nickel is coming from for the electric vehicle battery? Um, you know, sometimes I'll give him crap here and there. Like, you know, where do you think the cobalt for your Tesla came from? Because there's a good chance that, you know, it started with child labor in Congo. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I say it a lot nicer than that. Um, but you know, I wouldn't say he's like totally against these projects, but he's just kind of, you know, he's very, he, I just noticed that he agrees with a lot of the points against them. And I just say, Hey, you know, like if you're going to be taking the stance on that, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be driving around your Tesla anymore then. Um, so, 
it, it's kind of one of those things where we just have a mutual understanding. And, and one thing I've noticed that, you know, it, it's been, you know, to be straight up, I, I, we haven't had a conversation about these projects in a long time, just because we know how much we disagree on them. But I would say the one thing that kind of gets them thinking is when you make a Tesla, you know, you, when you make the point about a Tesla um, and then also too, just, you know, and we talked about this briefly before the show is, you know, just economically in Northeastern Minnesota, um, the state of Minnesota, for example, has grown by 25% over the past 40 years. But you look at some of these iron range communities um, that were built uh, from my, the iron mining industry that are literally mining towns. Um, you know, they, they've been struggling the past 40 years. We've been slowly seeing grocery stores and storefronts close. Um, and I, I would argue that it's because Northeastern Minnesota has been left behind economically. Uh, some of these communities have seen population drops in excess of 25%. And I would argue that it's because of bad policy decisions by both our state government and our federal government with no regard uh, for Iron Range communities at all. And uh, and so, like, you know, when you mention that to them and, and then you can say, OK, well, if Polymet were to go through, that's 333 parm. 330 plus permanent jobs that pay in excess of 90,000 a year in Northeastern Minnesota. Think about what that could do for a local community of a population of say 2,200 people. Um, and then also all the spinoff jobs. So I don't, I'm assuming Canada experiences the similar things, but for every mining job created in Northeastern Minnesota, there's two to three spinoff jobs that are created from that. And some people argue more, but statistically speaking, it's two to three. Um, so when you look at that, Polymet's going to create over a thousand jobs, uh, permanent jobs between spinoff and and uh, direct jobs on site. You know, think about the ripple effect that that will create economically throughout northeastern Minnesota. And then also, what does that tell for other young entrepreneurs that want to live in northeastern Minnesota? You know, they might start thinking differently now too. Like, oh, may, you know, it looks like northeastern Minnesota now is finally receptive uh, to these investments. And so it's just kind of a, that's what I try to tell them. And, and usually when I notice, when I talk to people who dis, who respectfully disagree with me about, about these projects is when you mention the labor jobs, the union jobs, um, you know, what it could mean for the local economy, how the population has been declining. And the fact that, you know, our renewable energy technologies are not being sourced from countries that don't have the same standard, same environmental labor standards as we do. That's when it's kind of, they really don't have much of a rebuttal to that. Um, what, you know, how can you argue against that? So, um, if there's anything, I think if I could eventually get through to my friend someday, uh, is, is those type of points. Um, and, uh, cause it's hard to argue against when you have, when you see stores that, I mean, excuse me, towns that were once thriving to now these towns can barely support a grocery store or can barely support a local hospital. Um, you know, especially cities like Ely, Minnesota, which is again, close to the Canadian border. Uh, their population has dropped by over 35% in over 40 years. Uh, they used to have two to three grocery stores. Now they just have one. And I don't know how that one is doing. Um, and, you know, you look at Twin Metals, for example, that represents 750 permanent jobs and over 1,500 incidental jobs um, in, a, in a city whose population has roughly 4,000 people. Um, that would be tremendous for them. Um, so, you know, you know, that's kind of what usually I know is hits home to some folks that are against it, where it's hard for them to argue that um, because you can't really find a replacement uh, for these jobs and you can't really find an alternative. I mean, the Minnesota Vikings, you know, they're not going to build a random football stadium in northern Minnesota around these populations. I mean, you know, they, it's just, you know, you, how are you going to talk Google into building a, a big data center in some of these communities? Um, but with mining, you can't pick where these projects are at. You got to mine where the resource is at. And it just happens to be in Northeastern Minnesota. So um, how can we do this responsibly and how can we do this safely? Yeah, I was going to ask what the alternative, if it's not mining, what the alternative is. But I'm hearing you say there isn't much of a, a viable alternative for, uh, uh, for jobs if these mining jobs don't, don't come online. No, it, well, and to your point, not to the degree of what these projects are paying. I mean, you know, there there's some good group, economic development groups here in the region that will, you know, say, try to attract a solar panel manufacturer. So there's actually a Canadian manufacturer called, uh, that does solar panels called Helene. Um, I think that's how they pronounce it, but um, they just built a new uh, facility 
on the iron range that that manufacture solar panels but i think that's only like i i have to double check the numbers um but i believe that was only 30 i shouldn't say only because these are good jobs regardless and i'm i'm grateful that there was an investment made in northeast minnesota but that was big news for a while but that was a 135 million dollar investment and 35 permanent jobs and then you look at a project like polymed that's a $1 billion investment just to construct the mine itself and over a thousand permanent jobs. And yet, you know, but that's how, you know, so that kind of puts in perspective there. And I have yet to see anyone uh, come up with a good alternative. Uh, they talk about tourism a lot. I would argue that tourism and mining can work together uh, in North, Northeastern Minnesota and, and, uh, and the tourism jobs just don't pay as well as the mining wages. It's not even close. I mean, I think the average tour, tourism jobs pays less than 20 grand a year. Um, how I, you know, I mean, if someone can support a family off that, I mean, I, man, I, they must be an, um, amazing with their money. Um, well, there's so seasonal there's, jobs as someone who yeah. grew up in Southern Manitoba, which is just slightly to the North of you. Um, tourism's definitely a seasonal job. It's way too cold in the winter for tourists. Yeah. And that's how it is. And, you know, like Ely is a little bit unique because there's so many folks that like to visit the boundary waters and it's beautiful up there. And, um, but still, I mean, to your point, I mean, it's like, even if you can pull off having that kind of job year round, it's doesn't compare to what a mining wage pays. I mean, when I say the average mining wage pays wage pays in excess of 90,000, um, the reason why I'm saying that number, I'm being kind of conservative with it, but lately um, I just haven't found, a, I just haven't done my research yet to find a, a real source. So I'm confident about pushing that number out. But lately um, from my friends in the mining industry, just from having conversations, like we're having conversations right now, they've been throwing out the hundred thousand a year salary mark quite a bit. Um, so I'm wondering with inflation this year and uh, cost of living adjustments, if if that average number is in excess of a hundred grand in Minnesota. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me. It's uh, it's probably north of a hundred grand in Canada, but that's in Canadian dollars. So there is uh, a currency <laughs> uh, adjustment to be made there. So yeah. Now, if people want to uh, learn more about your organization, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah, just visit our website at betterinourbackyard.com uh, or, or shoot me an email, uh, ryan at betterinourbackyard.com. Um, and then one of the things that we make a point of doing on a daily basis of telling that story of responsible industry is that we uh, consistently push out uh, content on our social media pages via LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, so if you want to follow us, follow our page on LinkedIn and Facebook. We we do have a Twitter page that we just started a couple months ago, but I'm still learning the ropes on that. But uh, if you want to see what we're really doing on a daily basis, uh, LinkedIn or Facebook, and then if you want to get involved with us, uh, yeah, again, just shoot me an email at ryan at betterinourbackyard.com. Okay, well, thank you for joining me. And I look forward to uh, down the road hearing more about what your organization is doing and uh, how things are progressing. Sounds great. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Michael. Thank you.